Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the opportunity that you give us to come together and feast together upon your word. We are so aware of our limitations. You are our comforter, our teacher. I just ask that you would give us, grant us, access to your to that throne of grace that we may come to you in in time of need we give you all the glory the honor and the praise filter out that which is foolish seal to our hearts that which is truth for it's in christ's name i pray amen hi this is steve at blessedhopeforever.com we're going through second corinthians verse by verse and in our last study together, uh, we had closed out the second chapter. And so we'll begin this morning, uh, and sometimes these uh, Sunday videos are uploaded on Saturday. Um, we'll begin 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now you'll remember that the second chapter ended with the dramatic statement, for we are not as many who make merchandise of the Word of God. We're not as many who corrupt the Word of God. But as of sincerity, as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And I mention this because it does bear on the sense and the meaning of the opening verses of the next chapter. Does he mean that the true Christian is separate from most others who make merchandise of the Word of God? Or is Paul saying that we are not like most Christians who make merchandise of the Word of God? Does that 17th verse speak of believer versus non-believer, or is the subject of that verse believers? And I suggested to you that the entire subject of the verse is the believer. This is the context the new creation in Christ Jesus. The verse says that most Christians make merchandise of the Word of God, and that is a sobering statement. And I believe that that is true in every generation. And of course, the greatest concern as I study this is where do I fit? You know, where do we fit? Where, where is blessed hope forever in this? I mean, are we like most who make merchandise of the Word of God? Or... Are we on the other side, where as of sincerity, as of God, we speak the truth in Christ? I'm not sure that I have a fully definitive answer on that. I can only say that in, in examining my own heart, I don't want to be coupled with those who make merchandise of the Word of God. But I am willing to admit that what I see, what I hear, and what I read leads me to believe that most of my brothers and sisters in Christ are making merchandise of the Word of God. I trust that that's not true here. I don't have any idea what kind of effort would be involved if I had uh, no means of communicating what I believe to be the truth of God's Word uh, I can't see that that's it's any great catastrophe. There are other places that you could go to gather together to fellowship and study the Word. Uh, I, can't, I can't see where it's any disaster. I think that's God's job. If the Lord doesn't keep this ministry going, let Him worry about that, that testimony within the, the online community. I mean, what difference does it make? It seems to me that when the burden becomes the size of, of the testimony, you know, the number of conversions, the number of uh, church buses in the parking lot, or, or the number of subscribers, or, or, or any other human criteria you might put on some level of spirituality, you're making merchandise of the Word of God. You know, here was a merchant who sold wine, and he, of course, was tempted to mix water with it so that he can make a higher profit. But if you're not doing anything in the way of selling, I have nothing to sell. 
The only thing I am is an ambassador for Christ. I'm not interested in money. I'm not interested in fame. I'm not interested in popularity or conversions. I don't care whether you agree with me or disagree with me. And it's difficult for you to set a motive in front of me that would cause me to put water in the wine because I, I first of all, I have no invested capital. I have no product to sell and I, and I have no motive to dilute it. Now, if I want a following, if I want to build a, an organization, I suddenly face temptation. And, and if one has the right techniques, the right uh, capability, personality, whatever, and, and puts the right organization together, it can really grow popular. And, and the temptations are immense. Just because one is a new creation in Christ Jesus, He's not shielded from that temptation. And I trust that we are not a, a body of believers who make merchandise of the Word of God with any human goals. Our purpose is to function as ambassadors for Christ, present the truth of the Word of God. And so the third chapter begins, it begins... Uh, do we begin do we now commend ourselves or do we need some kind of letters of recommendation from you or to you now isn't that characteristic of those who make merchandise and of the word of god uh, i talked to a christian briefly several weeks ago who mentioned some preacher uh can't remember who it was and i said you know, did you like the man? Well, he says, I don't totally agree with all of his theology, but he's very effective. You know, he has a lot of listeners. And I, and I, and so I said, well, what was he preaching? And he said, well, I don't, I don't agree with much of what he said, but he seems to have an effective ministry. Now think of the number of people who might go to hell if it weren't for his ministry. And, and what I heard him saying is sound doctrine, the work of the Holy Spirit, the sovereignty of God, the power of the Lord Jesus. That's not really all that important. What's important, you know, is a good advertising campaign, you know, a, a better advertising budget. You know, that means more in heaven. You know, poor God, he just sits up there somehow, I guess rather defeated. Now I hear my Savior say, other sheep I have which are not of this flock, them also I must bring. I must bring, not you must bring, that I might have one fold and one shepherd. When we studied through Colossians, it, we read, Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man and put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the one who created him, and, and so forth and so forth. Folks, if you preach, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, you need to do this, that, or the other thing to be born again and, and never read the next verse, justified freely by His grace. You know, it would destroy your whole message. Same with John 1.13. If you preached as many as received Him, to them gave He the right to become children of God, Therefore, your receiving Him makes you a child of God. And you don't finish the verse, who are born not of the will of man or the will of the flesh, but of God. It would destroy your entire message. And I think that is corrupting the Word of God. Folks, we can't just cherry pick verses or twist some verse to support our own narrative. That's deceptive. What we did was hide the sovereignty of God and the purpose of God. If I say to you, Behold, I set before you this day good and evil, choose good and live. Well, those of you who choose evil are going to hell. Those of you who choose good are going to heaven. Then I've taken a verse out of context. I've taken a verse that was spoken only to redeemed people, all of whom were going to heaven, and I've obscured from you the fact that you, as a Christian, had no choice in the matter. 
God never said to a child of the devil, Behold, I set before you good and evil, choose good and live. Never did that. He couldn't have chosen good if he had wanted to. So I think that's corrupting the Word of God. Especially if we are growing from it and profiting from it. Now my Bible says to be carnally minded is death. And the only person that can be carnally minded is a new creation in Christ who's going to heaven. You can't tell me that a child of the devil can be carnally minded. He's, all he is is a child of the devil. But the new creation in Christ Jesus can be spiritually minded or carnally minded. And I... I find my, my Bible defining death as carnal mindedness. And I see God saying to redeemed Israelites, all of whom will be in heaven, you'll see every one of them in glory. Behold, I set before you good and evil, choose good and live. If you choose evil, that's to be carnally minded. That's death. That's death, but that's not hell. But if that's what I preach, I'm deceiving you, and I am by that much making merchandise of the gospel. There's just numerous ways you can make merchandise of the gospel. You know, I need subscribers, I need followers, I, I need more money to reach more people, and, and, and that's easy for believers to understand because it sounds great, it sounds good. You know, Jesus' needs were met as were the needs of his disciples. He never started a system. He never wrote a letter. He never went on national radio and TV. Never got at the, the top of Google search results. You say, well, Steve, if there had been a, a YouTube back then, he would have. I don't believe that. Never did. The only thing he did was scratch a few words in the sand. And I... And and I'm the only guy, I'm the only guy in the world who really knows what they were. Now, now that's the very verse in Colossians, lie not one to another, you know, because that's a lie. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you what he wrote. He wrote BHF. You'll have to study that out for yourselves and you can, you can get the great insight that I have. You know, and I hope you all get the tone in which I'm saying this. Folks, I don't know what he wrote. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what he wrote. And I'm reading, we don't need any letters of recommendation. What is the evidence of a person's ministry? The results in, in their life and in the lives of others. The passage says, ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Dearly beloved, it says the epistle is written in our heart. What counts is not what you could write because all you can do is, is look on the outward appearance. You can say a man is deeply spiritual when he's not spiritual at all. You can say a person is absolutely honest when he's not honest at all. Because the only criteria that you have to use in your judgment is outward appearance. And God says He doesn't even look at that. And yet, most Christians are pretty sure that He does. No, God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. No, 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 no. no. no God sees whether you cheat on your income tax or, or whatever. Folks, God isn't keeping any record of that. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Right where we're going. This third chapter of 2 Corinthians is a dynamic chapter. Many of you are well, well aware of the fact Israel said, give us the law, tell us what to do, all that the Lord tells us to do, we'll do. Now, now you can't get any dumber than that. That's got to be one of the most stupid statements in all the Bible. You know, there are some stupid ones, but boy, that one's right up there as, as, a, as a candidate for president. All that the Lord tells us to do, we'll do. 
in Jeremiah, I think it's the, the, I believe it's the 32nd chapter of Jeremiah, God says, they've done nothing that I told them to do. They have not done one thing of all that I commanded them to do. But they said, hey, we'll do all that the Lord tells us to do. And he gave them the law. Well, they couldn't do it. So they started to rewrite it. And by the time that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared on the scene, they had it rewritten in, a, in about 400 volumes. They whittled it down to where that they could pretty well keep it and, and, and they could, so that they could say that in the eyes of the law, they did it. You know, the rich young ruler could come to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, all of these have I kept from my youth up. Now that's one of those top ten in stupidity too. But the reason that he could say that is because they had whittled the law down to where that he could say it. And I believe one of the great things the Lord Jesus Christ did early in His ministry is to highlight the fact that man had taken this law, which our passage now calls glorious, and whittled it down to something that they could meet. When the, the truth, the truth is that the Christian life has nothing to do with rules, regulations, or law. And the great contrast it is the chapter that we're headed into. I believe that making merchandise of the Word of God always leads to legalism. One of the things that you do in making merchandise of the Word of God is, is slowly bring people back to some degree or another under the law. One of the things that I need in making merchandise of the Word of God are recommendations from you, from you and to you. Those are external, but God looks only on the heart. He doesn't look on the outward appearance. You look on the outward appearances. God looks on the heart. So what really counts are not what you can write with pen and ink and not what you can observe in my life and or not what I can observe in yours, but what really counts is that which is written in my heart by you or by the Holy Spirit through you and that which is written in your heart by the Holy Spirit through me. And if, if you read only the second verse alone, it looks like that it's only written in Paul and Timothy's heart. You know, if you look at the third verse alone, it looks like it's only written in the Corinthians' hearts. But the truth is, what God is saying here is that the effectiveness of the ministry, the effectiveness of the ministry is what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts. Your heart and my heart. And that's all we need. That's all we need. But oh, how we're tempted to look upon one another outwardly and, and count subscribers or, or, or something. How, how many new subs did you have get this month or whatever? We want to look at those things we can see. And I believe our passage is saying the things that you can see are non-essential. Don't mean a thing. All we need is what the Spirit writes in my heart and what the Spirit writes in your heart. I believe that the effect of your ministry and every one of you are a minister. I don't, I don't believe that God has limited the ministry just only to just a few. Uh, you know, I realize there are gifted teachers, gifted pastors, gifted evangelists, and so on. Of course there is, but if you're going to call out every verse that speaks of that kind of of responsibility and say that well that doesn't apply to me because I don't have any talents in that area you're gonna have a shredded Bible God says study to show yourselves approved a workman that need not to be ashamed that's not me I don't you say I don't pastor a church I'm not I'm not an evangelist well that's not me you know you can get rid of that verse okay or, or be instant, in season or out of season, you know. Well, I, he's speaking to Timothy, Steve. He, he calls Timothy an apostle. That's not me. I'm not an apostle. 
You know, and pretty soon you don't have a whole lot left. And I believe that the Holy Spirit says in verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And I don't think that means only Paul. We found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that the increase is of God. Sure, we put out effort. We receive a reward for effort, but not for results. The results are of God. The growth is of God. We see the same thing in Colossians. The, when we went through that marvelous epistle, the body is of Christ. That means that the body is not the result of your work or your effort. I think anybody that stands up and says, you know, well, so-and-so had a chance to accept Christ, but they didn't, and so they went out from us, among us, they had a car wreck and died and went to hell. They, they really might have gone to heaven if they had just accepted Jesus Christ or if we had witnessed to them or, or whatever. That's deception, folks. I do not believe you're going to get to heaven and see the body of Christ with two missing fingers, one smashed toe, you know, and a dislocated shoulder. It is a complete body. The body is of Christ. And your effort has nothing to do with whether or not the body is a complete body. The body is of Christ. And the verse goes on and says, the increase is of God. And once again, I'm thrown back on the power, the sovereignty, the majesty of my God. The body is of Christ. The increase is of God. Now, am I arguing for you doing nothing? No, not at all. But I'm arguing for a reasonable understanding of what we do in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, the Bible is full of very simple illustrations. I'm, I'm amazed at how the Lord was able to take the simplest of things, you know, a fig tree, a fruit, a, a birth, or anything else, and use it to teach deep spiritual truth. I read these verses and I see an interplay between God and our hearts. That's of God. The increase is of God. The result is of God. It is not mine. So it isn't something that I engineered. He had already engineered it. And I am told in verse 3 that this is openly apparent. You are manifestly, and folks, that is a present passive. We don't make ourselves manifest. First of all, that tells me that this is something that's going on. If there's a real spiritual result in your life, it isn't going to be hidden. And secondly, it's a passive. It isn't something you're doing. You're not going out of your way to make everybody aware of the fact that now you're, you're something that you didn't used to be. God is doing this. It's a passive voice, not something that you do, but something God is doing. And he says it's being constantly declared, openly declared that you are the epistle of Christ. God is doing that. I don't think it's something that you engineered. They're not written with ink. They're not the kind of letters that you'd write. You don't become a, a part of Blessed Hope Forever because, because you have a letter from, some, from, let's see, from the church in Palermo, Italy, or, or Toulon, France, or you know, that you're a member in good standing. You know, folks, I don't know what that means. These aren't written with ink. They're written by the Spirit of the living God, not by Paul, not by me, not by you, but these are written by the Spirit of the living God. You know, he could have just said written by the Spirit, but he didn't. He said written by the Spirit of the living God. It's written by the Spirit of the living God. And he didn't write it in tables of stone. Dearly beloved, that's the law. That's what Moses carried down from Mount Sinai. Not written in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. In Ezekiel chapter 11, God says that my people have a stony heart. And I'm going to take the stony heart away. I'm going to give them a new heart, which is a fleshly heart. The word fleshly there doesn't mean carnal, but, but literal, literal physical flesh. God 
contrasts this heart here to a stony heart. I think the heart's the center of the being. Apparently, I have an incurably evil one, according to Jeremiah 17. And as I understand the Hebrew, it can't be cured. And if it can't be cured, I believe the Holy Spirit is working with a spirit-directed heart that's, that's, that's pliable in the things of the Spirit. And if I understand the scriptures He gave me, that leads to great trust in God. But that, but that kind of activity, letters of recommendation written in ink, you know, the law written in tables of stone, law, that is not what leads me to have confidence and trust in God. Because the law kills and the Spirit makes alive, as we'll soon see. What leads to confidence in God is the Spirit's work in our hearts. And we'll begin, Lord willing, with that verse, verse 4, next week. I love you all. I truly do. I want to take a moment to thank you all for your participation in this ministry. We're five and a half years in. Thank you all for your support, for your love, for your fellowship. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.